Yo, Sleepy GP here. Today we're going to be looking at a Lightning Dexterity build. So this is going to be level 125. We'll get 60 Dexterity with Millicent's Prosthesis. Just 59 Vigor and 37 Endurance and then 20 Strength so we can use a Great Bow as needed. But our main go-to is going to be this Power Stance Nagakiba setup. And on each of them we'll have Unsheath on one and then we also have the option to use Sword Dance on the other which has really really nice Hyper Armor whereas most of the rest of the moveset does not have hyper armor so having that option available is going to be really nice but we're not going to be limiting ourselves just to this setup we also have the option to run a halberd with an offhand nagakiba which i really enjoy it's not quite as strong as halberd off dagger which is the more meta setup but in invasions this can be really nice and you can get this kind of r1 l1 chain where you just kind of keep these two stuns consecutively running and if your opponent keeps mashing out of stun they're gonna just take a ton of damage so we have the option for a lightning dismounter as well a godskin peeler which i really like if you're gonna be up against somebody with low poise the early poise chips just really come out so fast and if you're getting a poise break with some of the early hits then you'll be delivering a ton of damage uh veterans prosthesis is also an option we have on this build and this is super strong given the running heavy attack into heavy attack follow-up that true combos and then you also have the running light attack which has massive range on this weapon and just does a ton of damage and then with Millicent's prosthesis and the rotten wing sword insignia you get the uh, cumulative buildup of AR as you land more successive attacks so that's gonna be really nice too and then we also have the option to run power stance sham shears so this can be another great way to get the bonus from Millicent's prosthesis and the rotten wing sword insignia as you land more and more consecutive attacks you're gonna be getting huge AR with weapons that already have great damage and just the one hand move set on the Shamshir is phenomenal as well so this can be a really nice weapon to use. You can kind of focus on the one-handed moveset, condition your opponent to roll for the timing of the running light attack, and then when you swap over to the running L1 with the power stance moveset, you'll oftentimes be able to roll catch them and do like upwards of 700 damage. So that's a great option as well here. And we'll just be using a variety of these things. We also have some lightning star fists, which I do enjoy quite a bit. Uh, and then we have raptor talons, which I won't be using too much, but they're good to have on hand. And then just some kind of standard weapon weapons that I enjoy like you know uh, great swords and then power stance uh, slender swords is you know not a bad option to have on if you're invading but um, not really the focus of this build so that pretty much covers what we'll be running today for this invasion showcase I appreciate you checking out the channel um, if you wouldn't mind considering subscribing I'd appreciate it oh real quick two things I did want to mention one we may be having an invasion with let me solo her so the legendary character from early Elden Ring days does make an appearance not sure if they're the real one but I did enjoy that invasion and they played pretty well so um, just something to keep an eye out for also I'm a little bit under the weather right now so you might be able to hear that in my voice but we'll go ahead and power through with this showcase but yeah let's go ahead and see what we got all right so to start things off we'll actually be using a weapon that I did not mention in the intro and that's going to be a blood infused heavy thrusting sword and I was just kind of curious about blood tax on this weapon I thought this might be kind of a fun setup to use so I go ahead and swap a talisman early on just so I will get an AR buff when I land a bleed proc and then I'm just mostly trying to find opportunities to use blood tax get a little bit of HP back and avoid all the incoming hits so using the kind of delay that comes after the attack from the HTS or from the greatsword rather I'm able to land one blood tax on one player and then I'm actually do able to do a nice turn and burn on another player and get that bleed proc so it's not really optimal on the build that I'm running an arcane build would be better but I was just kind of curious about it and uh, it might be something I incorporate into an arcane build in the future so I do need to back off a little bit we do have a decent amount of projectiles I'm trying to use sleep pots as a way to isolate my opponents even though there's not much cover I do land another blood tax so I'm starting to get a feel for how that Ash of War works and how effective it is and for pretty aggressive opponents it does seem to be fairly viable but the lower AR that I get on a bleed infused HTS just doesn't really feel like it's worth it so I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the Dragon King's Crag Blade again another weapon that I forgot to mention in the intro but one that I really have enjoyed recently and one that I might do an entire showcase on just because I feel like it's slept on a little bit and very very strong. Having an offhand Nagakiba can also be nice. You kind of get this priority mash setup where if you are one L1, keep that going over and over again, you're in a great spot to just 
you deliver a lot of damage and kind of keep your opponent in a bad spot if they keep trying to mash. So there are ways for your opponent to kind of counter that setup, but it is just a good option to have. And with the HTS, you get so much damage just with jumping attacks, with counter damage. Uh, this one is just a very high AR weapon in general. So, you know, the 60 dexterity is going to be very, very nice for a weapon like this. And it, it's just great for getting in lots of hits. So one of my biggest issues, I think, when invading in this area is judging how much range my opponent is going to have when they're on the stairs. So I've noticed this is an issue a number of times. Like, I'll be running up the stairs and my opponent will be chasing me with a Colossal Sword. And that Colossal Sword will swing just a little bit higher, uh, a little bit longer than I'm expecting. And so we'll see me take some hits from that Colossal Sword a number of times as I'm going up the stairs. There is one moment where I think I'm out of range and I'm just not quite. So I'm just kind of making the rounds in this area, trying to use all the different uh, just variations in terrain to my advantage, trying to make sure that I have spots that I can get out of. There are always the elevators, so that's good to be aware of if you want to really just get a moment uh, for yourself, you know, get a breather or potentially isolate an opponent. Using the two elevators in this area can be great. We do end up getting a player down with the Stormhawk Axe, so there's just been a lot of pressure for a lot of this invasion, and I'm starting to burn through some of my FP and some of my HP as well, so I figured that using the Stormhawk Axe trying to get them down uh, quite quickly is going to be a good option and it turns out to be the correct move against these players. So fortunately here I'm actually able to get off a freezing pot and not get hit by the Ash of War from the host and then I swap over to my fist weapons here, the uh, Veterans Prosthesis, and we see how much damage that does so quickly. Uh, so we've been in this invasion for a little while and I just kind of wanted to do something fun so I deliberately <laughs> missed that attack with the um, running heavy and I want to land the Ash of War with this weapon so I go ahead and drink my FP and this is how I really like to set up a connection with this Ash of War. Make sure your opponent's directly in front of you and then when they go for an attack you trade with it. You get, I believe it's super armor so rather than hyper armor which you can get knocked out of in some cases the kind of cloud effect that you get with Dragon King's Cragblade is going to give you um, kind of unbreakable hyper armor from pretty much everything I've tried other than like a, a status proc so a bleed proc or a frost proc will break you out of that hyper armor but um, I've gotten hit with colossal weapons uh, you know like a power stance jumping L1 from two giant crushers and uh, as long as your HP bar doesn't get deleted uh, you'll usually deliver the the full attack so Uncharged Dragon King's Cragblade is an Ash of War that I think is a little bit slept on. The charged version is fun too, but a little bit less consistent in my experience. Um, so we're going to go ahead and focus on this new invasion here. We have this definite gank set up here where we have a uh, Ko that's using <laughs> kind of a mix of, you know, spells and endure, which kind of negates the fact that you have you know, low hyper armor for all of your attacks with spells, so that's a, a smart move, but also something that's a little bit frustrating to deal with. Here I can see that they're coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and unlock for my Reign of Arrows, Ash of War, and just get it to kind of go right where I'm standing, and that ends up being probably the right move because we get a lot of damage, and then here we can see that Dragon King's Crag Blade Ash of War being effective. They try to trade into it, they lose the trade quite substantially. Um, I'm not even sure if I have um, Shard of Alexander on in this moment, so that just does so much damage, and for how can, oh, okay, it looks like I did, I did have Shard of Alexander, so, uh, a good uh, talisman to have, obviously, for that Ash of War, but it just does so much damage, um, it's kind of crazy, and the fact that you can land it fairly consistently, uh, just, it, it's kind of slept on, in my opinion, so, I kind of make a bad move here where I run out into this open field when I've got two players attacking me. It takes me a little while to adjust to this area. I would much rather be kind of in that castle doorway with the option to run up the stairs, kind of funnel my opponents into a smaller area. And this is where just like positioning is so important. So obviously I can get some great bow shots off. That's kind of the best I can do. If I get too close, I'm going to be in this really bad situation where we kind of saw earlier where I had two halberds coming at me and one of them had phantom slash so the phantom slash you know if i get hit by the host with a halberd and then hit 
by Phantom Slash. It all just combos, so we can see that happening right there where the Halberd stuns me first from the host, and then the Phantom Slash gets both hits in, and then potentially another hit coming in from the host again just does so much damage. So I think I'm starting to kind of get the picture in this invasion that I'm not standing where I should be. We do see some of the flies coming out as well, getting a little bit of blood loss buildup, and I'm making my way back over to the castle because I know that that's going to be better. And here we do get another blue spawning in, so they're not too close, but something that I like to kind of do more recently is go for, it's essentially a turn and burn with a frost pot, or uh, a sleep pot, and that can be really nice to just slow everything down and you can either attack out of it or run away. Uh, a lot of times you'll be kind of trading into it, but it, it can be nice, especially if your opponents are using a lot of FP and you'd like for them to have less FP, uh, it can be a nice way to go. So. Here we start moving through the Castle Soul, and that's definitely the way to go. We get a nice crouching attack with the Power Stance Katana setup, and then just follow it up with a single hit, and that's going to be enough to kind of delete everything with the blue. So just that one choice for changing our positioning, you know, isolating our opponent by going up the stairs and having the host not effectively follow the blue and not really cover them, that gives me enough time to finish them off and turn it into a one-on-one. -on -one. I do believe there's another blue in the world, but basically I'm just waiting for my opponent to either panic roll or if they don't panic roll then I'm just going to go for an attack with the HTS. Now this invasion was one that I had a pretty hard time with. As that player jumped up onto the ledge I used the fact that they can't roll in that moment to hit them with a crouching attack but my health is overall pretty low and they're just doing a lot of damage. Um, this was definitely tricky. We had a host that was light rolling and was very happy to use all the projectiles they could uh, and then we just have a lot of pressure coming from both co-invaders or uh, bo both golds rather so we do see the player with the lance and they go for a running heavy attack and i'm actually able to combo that into a bloodhound step uh, backstab so that's not something i try to pull out too often but i think it's a good thing to be aware of as just you know when you have players chasing you sometimes you can kind of go for that uh, hail mary of a backstab it, it's more consistent i guess than a hail mary but it's uh it's a little bit cheeky and i'm actually thinking about doing a video just kind of breaking down the reverse bloodhound step backstab or reverse quick step backstab um, just because i think it's becoming more prominent and it's kind of hard to deal with and it's really really deadly it's, it's a little bit cheesy i have mixed feelings about it but in some invasion instances it's just extremely useful so we do have kind of the the spam of projectiles coming from the host and we also have just good pressure coming from the phantom there's really no pve in this area which is a little frustrating i'm trying to use this little rock here as a way to get an estus cancel i don't fall enough to actually cancel the estus but nobody's around to punish it so that that's pretty nice. And now I just really like to finish off this Phantom. So I'm hoping to get a little chip damage with the Great Bow, nothing connects, and I'll be switching over to the HTS and potentially going for the big storm that is approaching with the funny L2 button on this particular HTS. So um, I kind of have that in mind here. I got a really nice moment where the tracking on the HTS really did not do me any favors against the host, but uh, just kind of serendipitously worked out against the Phantom. And here I'm just trying to pressure without taking too much damage from the host. And here we do get the funny L2. We managed to chase him down, do a soft swap over to a dagger and get the last bit of HP. And now it's just a one-on-one -on -one with the host. Uh, they are light rolling and really doing a lot of damage with either the daggers or the projectiles it's just not a great position to be in uh, you know if they don't want to get hit they're kind of able to do that fortunately they're still being aggressive with the daggers I think pulling out a parry wouldn't have been a bad option daggers are fairly easy to parry especially if they're using the power stance moveset uh, but they're gonna go ahead and heal and uh, we're able to Estus punish them just a number of times in a row which is pretty nice and they just kind of have this process of going for flasks, rolling out, going for attack, rolling out, going for, you know, a couple projectiles and rolling out. And because it's light roll, it's, it's problematic. But we get a number of potentially demoralizing Estus punishes against them. And here they realize that I am not actually out of Estus. And because all their friends are gone, they decide at this moment to DC. So uh, maybe a sarcastic clap would have been the way to go, but we can instead give them a bow that they inevitably did not see. So it doesn't really matter. And now we're moving on to our invasion with Let Me Solo Her. So let me solo her is gonna be a phantom here and I was running the fists to start out and 
Starfists are, are very good in the right capable hands, but unfortunately those are not my hands. I don't really run Starfists very much and was struggling a little bit early on. And we just get a lot of moon veils. Um, so we need to be worried about that. Uh, I think everybody either has a katana or a moon veil and it's just, you know, it's hard to find an opportunity to get hits in when you have to be worried about like these large, super damaging ashes of war that can just take up so much space. So what we go ahead and do is just back off a little bit. We try to buff up a little bit you know, get some magic resistance because we know Moonvale is part of the problem. And we're gonna go ahead and see what we can do over by the elevator. So, you know, I'm expecting a trap. Um, one thing about this elevator that's really nice is that it's super fast. So this is maybe the fastest elevator in the game. I don't know if any other elevator has this kind of speed. So what it means is that, you know, you can kind of surprise your opponent with how quickly you're gonna move up and down this elevator. And here this opponent is clearly baiting me. So what I'm gonna try to do is land some sleep pots and just kind of punish their ashes of war. And here we're actually successful with that. We don't get the true combo because there's like some weird little wall at the edge of the elevator that prevents us and so let me solo her does escape in this moment but we also escape as well so the sleep pot worked there um, and you will have noticed that I actually crafted these sleep pots like right before the person came up the elevator and so getting fast with your ability to craft things can really be helpful like that was the entire difference maker be between like winning and losing this invasion was being able to craft those sleep pots. So the host does go up the elevator and we were able to isolate one phantom and then we throw another sleep pot. We throw an extra one just in case and here we can take a moment to look at this opponent let me solo her and what I believe they were trying to do was infinite me. Go for endure and then use that staff to use a spinning weapon and just you know hit me over and over and over again with that. Fortunately they never got the chance because we were able to hit them with the sleep pot and then get the chase down with the fists. So um, you know, their setup would have basically just comboed into itself until I died had they been able to get it off. Fortunately, it was not the case and we we're able to come out on top against this group of three. So, you know, if that was the real one, uh, I don't know, but it was definitely a fun invasion and we're able to move on to this next one here. And this is a 3v1 that was was quite sweaty. Um, I recognized the host's name, so I was like, I'm not gonna not gonna rush this one. I know that they're a capable PvPer, and I am going to kind of take my time and try to come out on top here. So basically, what we're doing is just kind of seeing what they're gonna do. Uh, we know that they have a lot of AoEs. They don't see me and get hit with an unsheath, and that's kind of nice about that particular spot, and unsheath it just kind of goes through the wall in a way where you're able to get the damage off. I decide that I don't want to get caught in that room, so I go ahead and back off. And here I'm thinking of moving forward, but I'm kind of cautious, and we can see that that was a good choice as Grail's Roar comes out, as well as Howl of Shabriri. I Maybe not this time, Howl of, Howl of Shabriri will be coming soon, but basically I have a lot of Ashes of War that can potentially knock me off here and here we do get hit by one definitely need to back off in this moment there's howl of shibari and that's actually quite helpful to know that that's in the mix because that's going to debuff their resistance to damage we also get a frost pot in which does the same thing so that one player assuming that they're not going to ballast the frost is going to be taking a lot of damage so that's going to be helpful here as we decide to rush in a little bit and they may have been in their menu kind of assuming that they were safe but i go ahead and use rain of arrows without anybody seemingly noticing and just one shot that player so um howl of Shabiri was definitely uh, kind of a difference maker in that moment and we get hit with moon veil here for for some damage but not a massive amount which is pretty nice and here we get a sleep pot off and then we're able to combo that into a jumping attack with the power stance katanas i hear some red lightning coming my way so i decide to again back off. I'm really trying to play this smart and just not overcommit to any one thing because one mistake you can just get knocked off the ledge and uh, it'll be game over. So we do go ahead and shoot a couple arrows in back off again and this time the host is coming in with power stance spears and this is when things get a little bit scary because power stance spears are phenomenal for pressuring and then we also have somebody that has the option to knock us off the ledge so really what we don't want to happen is to to, for us to get frame trapped where you know we're either getting hit by the spears or the giant's flame take the 
And, or, you know, if we get hit by the spears and then we're stunned and then get hit by Giant Flame Take Thee and it knocks us off the ledge, that could be a huge problem. So here we almost get the host. Uh, we need to back off again because of the incantations in our area. And then we go for Sleep Pot one more time and that's going to be great for both getting rid of their FP as well as landing a crouching attack. We get a nice jumping attack. They do a good job of rolling and avoiding the unsheath. And here we almost fall off the ledge, but we actually use the cover of the tree to get two heals in. And here at this moment, the host does fall off the edge. They were not so lucky with their jump and were able to come out successful. Um, just kind of taking our time there, really not over committing to any one thing. And it proves to be beneficial to just, you know, get a little bit lucky with our jumps as well as um, navigate the area successfully, which is a huge part of it. So moving on, we have a, what starts as a 2v1 turns into a 3v1 in Limgrave, and we get hit by a few of these projectiles, and the amount of damage that those projectiles do just indicate to us that we are dealing with an overleveled phantom, which is not a huge surprise. Uh, we do get hit with, uh, <laughs> what is that, Stars of Ruin? Uh, no, 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 Elden Stars, yeah. Uh, so they cast that, so we just back way off. We don't really want to deal with that. Uh, this is a decent spot to be in because it requires a jump to get onto this platform, and we can usually punish players with the great bow if they're trying to jump onto the ledge and sometimes just knock them off over and over again. But what happens here, and a tactic that I don't often use, is just uh, stealth. So they don't really know where I am, and I'm able to get a rain of arrows on the overleveled phantom, and actually the host a little bit, but I'm focusing on the overleveled phantom here. And I get three great bow shots off altogether, including rate of arrows, get them very low, and they don't heal immediately, which is a bad choice because I had tossed a couple fan daggers and get that last bit of age da eight damage there and uh, just come out on top against a player that had, uh, you know, the opportunity to give us 200,000 runes, which means I think they're around level 500. Um, then we're quickly able to knock the blue out of the air using Hand of Melania um, with our Unsheathed Heavy Attack, which is a great counter to that. Knocks them out of the air every time. Uh, does more damage than some of the chip damage they get with Hand of Melania, so that's great. And then here the host does DC. So, uh, you know, when the overleveled Phantom and the blue both don't work out, uh, maybe it's time to leave the game i don't know that's up to them but moving on we have a 2v1 against a very capable group i think they were going for kind of a funny combo here with bolt of grand sacks and uh the radon ash of war so an interesting setup here we don't commit too early try to find out a little bit more what they're running uh it's definitely a in strength build from the host so we need to look out for uh just kind of their different gravity attacks and here we can see the idea of the combo where they'd pull us in with their radon sword and then we'd potentially get hit with both of grand sacks from the phantom so not a bad idea uh, a blue does come into the world but they I'm not sure where they are for the duration of this. They might die to PvE early on. Uh, it's not really clear. Here I decide not to try to backstab them, and I think that was the right call as they were free aiming their Ash of War. And again, we get the setup with both the Grand Sacks and the Radon Swords. Uh, we do avoid it all. So we're really trying to be cognizant of that gravity pull because it could just result in so much damage. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Bolt of Grand Sacks hit comboed into the uh, follow-up with the Radon Swords. So it would just be like the gravity attack, Bolt of Grand Sacks, and then the follow-up attack with the gravity attack, uh, just all doing a ton of damage. So Avoiding that, I think, was pretty key in this invasion. And we do switch over to the Power Stance Sham Shears. So this isn't something that I run all the time, but I felt like I wanted pretty big burst damage. And I also noticed that the Phantom was running fairly low poise. So we're gonna try to maximize the amount of damage we uh, are able to do with our running L1 by landing a couple Frost proc, uh, Pops first. And that's gonna be very helpful, even though we are using a mixture of lightning and physical damage, uh, still just buffing your physical damage is never a bad thing. And we're able to get a couple hits in with Sword Dance, and then as our opponent is running away, we are able to dodge the gravity one more time, avoid their heavy attack, as well as the follow-up. And here we get the early poise break that results in the full hit from the running L1, doing over 700 damage, and leading us to a nice backstab, uh, followed up by just a quick chase down with Sword Dance and we can see the fact that our opponent is falling. They don't have iframes in that moment, it means that we're able to get the last bit of HP and move on to the next one. So this one was just a great moment where <laughs> I really thought I was gonna die and was able to, uh, well, I guess you'll see what happens. So we get very low health, we also get poisoned, so we're running low. Uh, there's just a number of attacks that we need to avoid. Uh, it wasn't all reaction rolls, but uh, some panic rolls in there for sure, but we kind of maintain 
maintain most of our composure. We also did a funny thing, which is to just, while you're running away, just kind of stop and heal. Um, and a lot of people will have this kind of forward momentum and miss their attacks, which did happen there. And then here we just kind of use this elevator that's so fast to isolate ourselves with the host and then get the necessary crouching attack to come out with the victory. So uh, definitely a tight spot there and one that I was happy to get out of alive. Um, moving on, we have 3v1 have somebody running Handabalania. We also have a host with almost no vigor. Uh, not too surprising these days, but Handabalania mixed with this host that has the potential to do a ton of damage with their spells. And then we also will see a player running the Raptor Talons with the uh, Blood Flame Blade buildup. Uh, so that's very scary using our Ash of War to kind of um, just get the initial stun and then get some nice crouching attacks for the victory is going to just kind of out DPS them and we were able to not get hit by too much and then here as we're kind of ready to chase down the host I think the host had kind of given up at this point now we're able to switch our pots I was hoping to just kind of zone a little bit with this volcano pot but uh, they just kind of stopped moving so we're able to land a jumping light attack and come out with the victory again um, so that was just kind of a nice 3v1 now this 3v1 has probably some of the worst net I've seen in a little while. Uh, maybe that's not entirely true, but here we can see the Phantom trying to infinite the uh, PVE here. So that's that kind of tactic that I was worried about. Let me solo her using earlier and something to be aware of. You get hit with it once or twice and you realize how powerful and just kind of broken it is. So I recommend maybe not using it, but uh, if you've got the int build and you want to use something pretty game breaking, uh, that's always an option. So we do see a player uh, just kind of casting a lot of spells and they decide that they don't want to be isolated, which is probably the right call. We go for one great bow shot here, unfortunately hitting the railing, but we do go in for a rain of arrows attack and do just kind of one shot them since they had 900 HP which is uh, pretty typical for, you know, uh, a wizard these days. Now, we do get hit with a little bit of some desync, and then we also go for a crouching attack that maybe hit, like, three miles away on the host. Not sure what happened there, but again, some of the worst net I've seen in a long time, and so I guess that just kind of goes both ways. Rarely does it go in your favor, but when it does, it's pretty nice. Um, here we get a nice frost pot on the light rolling player, and we're just kind of trying to avoid this Ash of War coming from the host, and just kind of bait our opponent here into, you know, maybe they'll go for a crouch attack and we'll come out with ours just a little bit earlier. And because they're running virtually no armor, hopefully we'll out damage them. That's kind of the plan. Um, and here we go for a really nice swap. Um, this is one that I don't do too often, but one I would highly recommend is just using something like Thunderbolt or an Ash of War that has some range and having that on a swap. Normally my Muser Accord has Bloodhound Step on it, um, but in that moment I really wanted Thunderbolt and it was absolutely the right call to just kind of swap that Muser Accord, even though it's not one of my main hand or offhand weapons, um, it is my soft swap weapon. So um, really just making sure your inventory is in a good spot can be the difference breaker of you know how an invasion goes. And here we are landing a number of attacks. Uh, doesn't look like they're connecting, but if we wait a minute, we do get the, uh, the full pop there. And we just kind of take a minute to acknowledge how bad the net code is. So we give that player a bow. Um, and moving on, we have another invasion, and this was just a funny little gank setup, uh, a 2v1, and I'm actually going to let this play out. Um, if you want to watch the full thing, it has one of the most elaborate chase downs uh, that I've done in a while, and also some impressive parkour from the host. Uh, they do some parkour that I've never seen before, so just really fun stuff in this particular gank setup, uh, but I'm not sure it is necessary for me to commentary over it. So um, yeah, if you made it this far, I really appreciate you being here. Um, you know, taking the time to watch these full videos is, is always really nice. And I'm gonna be trying to be a little bit more consistent with some of the stuff that I upload. I know that it's been a little while since I've done a video, but I have been playing Elden Ring um, and I have been trying to improve as always. And I just have some stuff in the mix that I'm planning on doing. Uh, one particular video that I'm extremely excited about. So um, we have some fun stuff coming up the pipeline, but yeah. Uh, thanks so much for watching, and I hope you enjoy this. Also, a very special intro or outro is, is coming as well, so if you want to skip to the end, that's there. But uh, some funny things happening in the lakes with a notorious player called Bfuzz, so uh, always a good, good time there. Anyway, uh, take care, and appreciate you being here.
Thank you.